well, moving more trees. We knocked down a few. I wanted to get a video, but uh, by the time I got to it, they had already knocked them down. Uh, so we are transplanting some. Uh, oop, hold on. I dropped a seed. Ah! I dropped a seed. All right, anyway, so there's a guy I transplanted a while back. Uh, I realized that his story is uh, very much like our family's story. Um, in a non-ideal condition, doing the best it could, kind of a unique thing, just kind of just there doing its own thing. Uh, and then when the time was right, we uh, pulled it up and uh, put it in a much better spot, and now it's thriving, very much like... Uh, very much like our family's story. So since this place, we call this place Ebenezer from uh, 1 Samuel 7, 12, as well as the song, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. There is a, uh, there's a lyric in there. Uh, Here I raise mine Ebenezer, hither by thy help I'm come. Speaking to Yahweh about his provision in our lives. So this place we are call Ebenezer and uh, I named this tree Ebenezer as well, since it reflects our story. Um, we found some other tiny little cedars. These guys, we got one, two, three, four, five. Uh, found them over where we knocked down some other trees. We didn't want to mow these down, so um, moved them here. Also, I went to take pictures of where, the, where Ebenezer was planted uh, before we moved him, and I found these. These are cedar berries. Uh, they are dropped by the female cedar trees. The, the uh, plants have what we call male and female. Um, you know, uh, the scientific terms would be uh, one produces the pollen and the other produces the berries that can become seeds that will grow into trees. So what I'm going to do is I have seven of these. I think I've dropped a couple along the way. Um, Oh well. But uh, I'll put probably two, two, and three seeds in little clumps. Um, each seed will be a couple inches from the other. And well, in fact, let me just show you. So a cedar tree will get to be 80 feet tall and about 20 to 40 feet across as far as spread from one branch end of one branch to the end of the other branch on the other side of the tree. So I want to put these, we'll probably um, harvest them before they, shoot, before they reach that height. Usually they'll grow a foot or two every year for the first 30 years and then they'll live many decades after that. So what we'll do is we'll plant them about 20 feet apart. So uh, we're also going to put them along the property line. So first I'm going to walk up to the property line and then let's see, if they get 20 feet in diameter, that means about 10 feet from the, um, let's see, let me actually do it over here. No, where do we want this? Oh, there, right. Okay, so we're gonna put it over there. Now I don't want it to get into the telephone poles, the telephone lines, so we will put it like 10, 15 feet from the telephone line that way when they um yeah yeah wait a minute i'm thinking about this all wrong i'm gonna plant them over on this side the lock does a nice wind break um they'll be i mean we have we have good neighbors so it's not like we need a break from the neighbors um but it'll be it'll be better to put them along this way especially since you know sometimes Trees don't grow the way you expect them to. So, what I'll do here, go to the neighbor's property line, step back 10, 15 feet from there. An easy way to pace that is uh, I have, I'm just under six feet tall, so my stride will be about half my height, which is about three feet. So, we do one, two, three, four, five. That is very approximately 15 feet. So take one of these guys. Now general rule for seeds is as big as the seed is, that's how far it goes underground. So I'm just going to put him in there. There we go. And then cover him up. And that's it. If he is ready to grow, then he will grow. And then take another one. 
So you got about there. Cover them up. There we go. All right. So that's two. So now I'm going to take, uh, let's see. I want them to be out 20 feet apart. So it'll be 10 feet from the trunk to the edge of the branch and then the edge of the next branch to the trunk of the next tree. So uh, let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Makes approximately 20 feet. So now we're going to do another two. One, poke him in there, cover him up so the birds don't get him. Reminds me of, uh, uh oh. <sighs> there they all went. Rats. Okay, well. <sighs> yeah, good luck finding the. Alright, well, I guess that's kind of like what um, Christ talked about in his uh, parable of the. Oh, what do we call it? I think in general it's called the parable of the sower. That, uh, you know, uh, a man went to sow grain in his field as he threw it. Some of the, whoops, some of the grain fell in the field and produced a good crop. Some of it fell on the rocks and was choked out. It took root quickly, but it was choked out by thorns. And there's others that fell on the path and the birds ate it. So in this case, I planted a couple that went in the ground, uh, so the birds probably won't find that. And I found, I planted a few others, and I didn't really plant them. They fell out of my hand, which is really a bummer. I may go back and see if there are some more berries where I found the others. But, uh, yeah, so he knew what he was talking about. That's kind of that's kind of how it goes, planting seeds. So, yeah, further excursions in cedar trees. Um, it'll take years for those to be set up, but a lot of what we're doing now is planning, planning and planting for the future rather than to get it right now. Uh, cedar, eastern red cedar is what we have. It's good for outdoor work, um, building construction stuff, very rot resistant, so that'll be great. It'll be good lumber in 10, 15 years. So, yeah. Wednesday, those trees that we knocked down, we split up and uh, stacked. I'll show you those in a minute. Uh, you can't see it from here, but we have a hornet's nest. It's down in there. It looks like this brown papery bag. Oh, about the size of my fist. It's a small hornet's nest. Um, so we're going to have to get rid of those. So we were doing some research because, you know, one of the, especially after we've moved out here, one of the first questions that we have is, is there a way that we can coexist with this? And how did people deal with this? How did the the um, how did people deal with this before um, the Industrial Revolution? You know, when they didn't have, when you could not afford to just kill everything around you because you could buy food from the grocery store. When you couldn't just turn on the AC because there was no electricity. We, if you live, if your survival depends on living with the land that you live on, how do you do that? Well, turns out that there is only one species of hornet in Indiana. It is the European hornet, and as the name suggests, it is not native to America. So there are no true hornets native to America. Now there are wasps, but wasps and hornets do not behave the same way. Wasps in general, they have a different build. Um, wasps in general, wasps and yellow jackets and bees um, do not, um, they don't really, they're not aggressive. They will not attack you just for the sake of attacking you. They will generally walk away uh, if you are threatening them, or if they think that you're uh, keeping them from their food source, they might bite you or sting you. But hornets are very territorial. Um, they uh, mainly, they defend their larvae, but they are producing larvae almost all year. And so they also eat uh, a wide variety of insects, including bees and other wasps. We want to encourage bees and wasps, especially species that have been here for hundreds of years. Um, 
but especially since we know that hornets do not, as far as we can tell, hornets specifically, the European hornet, which we have over there, does not serve a unique purpose. And it is a danger to us because unlike a bee, they, um, they can sting multiple times and they will sting repeatedly. Um, they can fly faster than you can run, so you can't outrun them. And they don't really have a concept of personal space. Any space that they fly in is theirs. So if you are within sight of them, there is a good chance that they will decide that you are the enemy and they will attack. Uh, we can't do that, especially since we intend to make the most use, the best use of this land, of all of it. Um, and that is right at the edge of the woods, a, a good throughway for the woods, which we plan to make use of pretty soon. Um, all of those add up to a decision that we hope we will not have to make very often. We will try to avoid having to make this decision. Um, but in this case, we have to kill them and we have to use a poison because um, if you get within, like you can't even take a long pole because they'll be nearby. But um, we do have, um, our grandparents had it and when they moved in with us, they, they brought it with them. Um, so my grandpa has a, a uh, hornet spray. It's a poison um, that you, you can stand like 10 feet away and spray it in a jet stream to soak the nest. You do it in the evening because apparently they're active both day and night, but they kind of have cycles. So they'll be active during the day and then a short activity during the nighttime. Um, so during the evening, they usually, um, they're usually more dormant. They're, so they're all going to be in the um, nest while uh, during the evening. So some evening this week probably we will stand just out of range, soak the nest with hornet poison, and run. Um, my grandfather has a story of a, uh, a boy that he knew when he was a little boy and being boys, being young, they weren't exactly the smartest. So one of them decided, oh, I'm going to take my dad's shotgun and uh, shoot a hornet's nest. Well, from the way my grandpa tells it, he shot the guy shot the hornet's nest. And the hornets followed the smell of the smoke to the gun and decided that he was the attacker. So uh, the, the boy survived, but uh, he, uh, the way my grandpa puts it, he looked like a balloon for about a week. So we would like to avoid that. So after we've made the decision that the hornets have to die, that particular one, we're not doing an entire clearing of the entire forest. We've only seen that one. So we're gonna spray that one and run and it'll be over. Um, so none of us are exactly happy about that, but it is the question of, um, well, at least one individual in my family is deathly allergic to bee, bee wasp, and hornet stings. Um, the last time they got stung, it was um, it was not good, and this was before we moved on to this property. Um, so we are looking at kill the hornets or a possible death in the family, uh, and that is not that is the ugly side of the reality that we have moved into. Um, part of the sin cursed world that. Um, modern technological fantasies keep us from acknowledging. It, they don't keep it from happening, but they, uh, rem they set up barriers between the reality that is and the reality that we perceive. Um, moving out here uh, strips away a lot of the, and living the way that we do strips away a lot of those barriers between um, what you choose to believe is real and what is actually real. So in this case, we do have to make the d d decision between the death of a human being and the death of a few insects. So in this case, we have made the decision that the insects have to go. Just those. Um, we're not going to scour the woods for more hornet's nests. We're going to keep an eye out because we know that there are hornets in the area. So we'll keep an eye out. We know what the nests look like. So we know what to look for in future. So enough of that. Uh, logs. We have a couple 
uh, side ventures we're looking at. Uh, we are getting a sawmill, uh, a Wood Miser brand sawmill. They make them to order, so you you know they have some presets. They say, hey, we have this, this, and this, and you order those, and then they make them to order. They don't just have them sitting in a warehouse. So it could be another four to six weeks before we get it in. Uh, but my dad and my grandpa are going to uh, see if they can't turn some of this into uh, lumber, um, which would be great for our own use because lumber is so expensive, or good for people in the community. We would love to be able to offer something that is a, that is um, a good a good deal, um, both in quality and price. Um, but our biggest accomplishment for the day, well, besides continuing to dig garden beds, I think we are up to 17 now. We had to mow down some more grass in order to make room for more. Um, we've got beans, okra, carrots, kale, um, a, a Malabar spinach, which is a climbing spinach that creates vines, so it'll go up a bean pole. A um, bunch of other stuff. I'll talk about those probably later in the season when we can actually see them, all that green and growing stuff. Oh, I'm, I'm really... Ah, uh, I'm excited about it. I'm looking forward to that. But this is what we did. We stacked all of this. So this is... Let's see. Now, if I am six feet, approximately, a little shorter than that, uh, my stride will be about three feet. So, one, two, three... Okay, so this is about eight, nine feet long, and oh, probably three, three and a half feet high. So, introduce you to a couple terms here, woodworking, t or uh, lumber terms. So there, the term is a rick and a cord. A rick is a pile of wood, eight feet long, so, yeah, eight feet long and four feet high. It doesn't matter how wide it is. So I'd say this is approximately a rick. So if you buy a large amount of firewood, uh, like uh, many people in the area have uh, wood-burning stoves that heat the house, uh, it's good for the when the electricity goes out. Uh, because we are a fair distance from the city, we are in a rural area, um, it is not... It is not a rare occurrence. It's not common, but everyone here is is set up and prepared for uh, a power outage, usually for a few hours. Um, we're not sure if uh, there have been outages, a day-long outages, like where we would be concerned about food spoilage, but um, a lot of people here have wood-burning stoves. It also cuts down on the cost of uh, heating the interior of a house during the winter. Uh, so sometimes they'll buy ricks of firewood at a time. A cord is the same dimensions as a rick, eight feet long, four feet high, but also four feet deep. Uh, so in this case, this would be, this is only two, two and a half, maybe three feet deep, depending on the size of the log. So it'd be another at least foot longer if you were selling a cord. Um, cords are mainly for, um, for industrial uses like when they are burning massive amounts of wood. Uh, cords, if I understand it correctly, um, that particular method of measurement was used for, uh, for when trains were the main transportation system in the United States, and they would use firewood to, to uh, stoke the, the train engine. And so they would, they would, they developed a, a method of measuring how much. Now, I could be totally wrong on that, but yeah, that is what I have heard. So, that's what I'm going with for now. And if somebody corrects me, great, I'll accept that correction and uh, move on. So, yeah, those are, the, uh, those are the big accomplishments for the day. One interesting thing we've had to work with that I don't mind at all is adapting to the weather um, up in the city. When we lived up in the city, uh, the weather didn't affect our, whoa, wind, lots of wind. Hold on. There we go. I bet that didn't sound too good, did it? 
usually uh, I know from a uh, little bit of film experience that uh, wind in a microphone does not uh, sound good at all. So I'm here behind this big old tree. So that's a good windbreak. Um, yeah, so getting used to uh, adjusting our work to the weather because sometimes it just genuinely gets too hot to to work outside comfortably. I have a fair amount of sunburn here. Um, and a couple of us have suffered from some sort of heat exhaustion. Not heat exhaustion quite, uh, like on the edge of it. Um, so figuring out how to deal with that. Uh, head coverings, uh, working smart at different times of day. Um, yesterday what we did was we did a whole lot of um, heavy work in the morning as the sun was coming up and then stopped at like 11 and didn't get started until after dinner. Um, but then we got three or four beds dug uh, during those two times. And apparently that's how uh, certain cultures in Europe uh, did it during the medieval period. The field workers, they would work early in the morning, uh, like in Italy, certain very hot sunny areas of Italy during the summer especially, they would take a three or four hour break in the middle of the day. Uh, and they would, then they would make up for it in the evening as it was cooling off. Especially since summer days, you know, uh, even here, we're not on the same latitude as the sunny areas of Italy. But um, sunset isn't until 9.15 right now. And uh, 9.15 in the evening. And sunrise is like 5.30 or 6. So we have like 15 hours of sunlight. So if you take a break for 3 or 4 hours, you've still got 11 hours of sunlight to do your work, rest some more, plan, um, eat. It's amazing how much time food preparation takes up. And I've also found that uh, the saying that uh, hunger is the best seasoning is very true. Food tastes so much better to me now that I can actually be out here and work my tail end off every day and then come home and uh, come hear the bell ring, the massive bell. I don't think I've shown you the bell. I need to show you that. So it's kind of windy. I'll see if I can maybe protect the microphone from the wind. But this, this is the bell. I love it. It's, uh, I don't know if it's cast iron or what, but uh, I'm not going to, hold on. There we go. I'm not gonna ring it because we only ring it for meal times, so it would really confuse people if I rang it, and it would probably blast the microphone here because it is really, really loud. Um, it was designed to be heard across an entire 50-acre parcel. We only have 19 and a half acres of what of the original 50-acre parcel from oh probably 100 plus years ago, um, but it's been like I said parceled off. But the bell is still there, and it was intended to be heard in a 50-acre area. So, it's loud. It gets really loud. Um, but yeah, so when we hear that, come home, and wind's picking up again. We've had storm and winds on and off today, so um, yeah, it's, I love it. Absolutely love it out here. But uh, yeah, adapting to the weather. And uh, there's probably too much wind, so I'm gonna cut this short. But yeah, adapting to the weather, you know, uh, come out when when it's sunny, but not too sunny, and then go in when it's raining, and then come back out. There's always something to do. Uh, there is always. There's a, um, there are a couple sayings. One is, um, only boring people get bored. I kind of agree with that. Uh, I've found that as I have matured more um, I have found way there is always a way to make oneself useful or uh, productive even if you if it is just to rest even rest is productive we are not machines we are not gods we need a break and rest can be productive and uh, there's also the saying idle hands are the devil's tools um, I would agree with that as well. It's not in the Bible. Neither of those sayings are in the Bible, but it seems to be pretty accurate that um, we kind of go haywire when we have nothing to do. 
So the fact that we can be out here and there is always something, not just something to do like busy work, just to do it for the sake of doing it, but there is something good to do if it's learning how to play Texas Hold'em with, uh, with the, fake, the fake chips or uh, running around in the woods or researching what to do with poplar wood. I love it. This is amazing. I love it. Friday evening. A lot has happened in the past couple days. We uh, got a new trailer. 14 foot bed. So that's nice. Helped us uh, move a fair pile of wood. That pile of wood from the uh, previous video. Um, not the previous video. Yeah. Yeah, it was, it was yesterday. Previous video I took, but not like yesterday's episode. You didn't miss anything. It, you, you just saw it. Duh. Um, one thing that we are really, really proud of, at least I'm proud of, uh, is we got the garden beds dug. Now, um, not all of the garden beds, but the biggest ones dug. So each of these is 40 feet long, approximately. We kind of got longer as it went along. So some of them are 40, some of them are about 43. Four feet wide, um, and then the paths are three feet wide. So what we did, if you remember, if you don't remember from the uh, previous episodes, the bed in the in the or the dirt in the bed, we turn it over. Then we dig up at least six inches from the path next to it. So let's see. So there's the bed. Flip it over. Take the path, the dirt from the path, and put it on top of the bed. Well, this is heavy clay soil, so it is quite dense as dirt goes. So we did a very rough calculation on how much dirt we moved. And I don't remember what the cubic feet was because I was more concerned about the weight. The weight of these, if you have 40 feet long by four feet wide for the beds and three feet wide for the paths, 20 of them 50 tons. We have moved almost 100,000 pounds of dirt by hand in three weeks. I am proud of that. I am genuinely proud of uh, what we have done. Um, did I step on somebody? No, I felt a piece of dirt under my foot and it felt like a toad. I've stepped on toads before. I don't want to do that. It, it's no good for them. Um, but yeah, so it has definitely been an entire family effort. Almost everyone on this property has had a hand in turning over the dirt, but everybody has had a hand in it in some way. Uh, people have cooked food, provided water, given advice. Um, the grandparents here um, have uh, both offered advice and tips and support on this and uh, some of the younger siblings who um, maybe they aren't, weren't able to do very much, they would still run and get drinks or get them planted. All but the last two are planted, I think. So everyone has had a hand in making this a reality. Um, that is the main thing that I am proud of is that our family has uh, worked together that is something that uh, we can do regardless of our circumstances. Um, this is simply a logistical accomplishment, but our true moral and spiritual accomplishment has been working together in harmony, and I am very proud of that. And uh, another discovery we've made, well, not really discovery, just kind of confirming things. Um, a couple episodes ago, I may have mentioned us sharpening shovels. Now, that was something I had never heard of until uh, we heard about it from the Survival Gardener on YouTube. The, uh, David the Good, or David Goodman is uh, the guy who, who runs that channel. Um, fantastic channel. And uh, he sh uh, cleans and sharpens his shovels after every use and I thought that sounded so strange but we tried it and it has really really helped tremendously uh, so 
what we've done now we do have we do have a couple of belt grinders um, they actually both came well one came with the property and the other one came with our grandparents so um, this this is uh, a lot of what we've done um, we also didn't realize how many shovels we had between us and our grandparents. We have a lot of shovels, so that has helped as well. So basically what we'll do now, these haven't been cleaned or sharpened today after using them, but uh, what we'll do is we'll just clean off, let's see if we can get this close here, yeah. So what we'll do is we'll clean off this bit, the part where, uh, where we'll sand down, where we'll sharpen, and then we sharpen this to an edge. It doesn't have to be like knife sharp, but sharp enough so that when you run your finger across it like this you can feel it catch a PSA public service announcement do not run your finger across a sharp edge this way so if the edge runs like that do not run along the edge to test for sharpness the uh, physical chemical molecular structure of just the fact of how a blade works is severing the molecular bonds between I mean every Everything, including like a shovel going into dirt or a knife chopping vegetables, is based on physics on the molecular level. So a blade works by a hard, rigid line of molecules severing the bond, the weaker bond between two molecules along this way. So it goes, well, what happens when you do this? So don't do that. If you're going to check the sharpness on anything, a shovel, um, the end of a broad fork, uh, which I think I still need to show. No, I've already shown that. Um, or edge of a shovel, do it across the blade, not along the blade. So yeah, uh, you can sharpen stuff with uh, with a belt grinder is a whole lot faster and easier. Uh, or you can use a file as long as the file is harder than the actual metal you're sharpening, which is not difficult. Uh, there are very few metals that are going to be harder than the file. Uh, that you're using but we use a belt grinder on these um, yeah and uh, just make sure that we make sure that the edge gets clean first because dirt has tiny 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 bits of grit in it and those will get caught in the grindstone and that really becomes a problem oh you know what? Uh, actually it's not a belt grinder it's a it's a stone grinder um, so yeah that that becomes a problem if the uh, the hard edge of the stone catches little bits of grit that grit will grind on the blade every single time that it rotates and it rotates hundreds of times a minute um, so yeah make sure whatever if you ever sharpen anything make sure that it is clean before you sharpen it wildlife updates the uh, hornets that I had mentioned previously um, we took part of a bottle of uh, that hornet poison that I had mentioned and we went in and we soaked the um, soaked the nest and then walked out um, like I said I don't like the idea of having to kill something but as I've already discussed at length um, it was the best option that we had available. So it is done. So we can now, there's something in those woods. I wouldn't be surprised if there's a deer in there uh, that I can't see. I don't know if maybe you can. One of these days I'll have to take this phone into the woods and show you what it's like in the woods. It's lovely. Especially since we've um, cleared out some of the dead some of the dead wood you can see a little further. Um, we will need to work on improving the edge here. Okay, I'm gonna get weird here, permaculture weird. So this whole idea of grass, 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 vines, trees, is entirely unnatural. If you look at um, uh, areas in the Midwest, forested areas in the Midwest that have not had um, constant mowing or people chopping stuff down what naturally happens is there are several layers of understory before it gets to the trees so you'll have the grasslands and then you have vines and then bushes and then shrubs and then small leafy trees and then the tall trees the reason for that actually there are many many reasons for why it works that way um, 
as this is right now, there is no buffer for cold winds that blow through there, or really any winds, hot winds, cold winds that, that come through here. Um, there's just nothing. So it'll go, let me get closer so you can see. I think the white, oh, it's balancing for the white on my head so you can't see in the woods there. There we go. Let me see if I can make this. That'll be all right. Let me brighten it up a bit. There you go. So, because this has been mown so regularly, any opportunity for any shrubs to grow up and block the winds that blow through here um, is eliminated because it's constantly mowed down. Um, and so, the reason... Um, the reason that those shrubs exist is that wind barrier. It, uh, it keeps animals from, including people, from just tracking in and out all the time. Um, it actually prevents pests because the, uh, young trees further in, they are most likely to be affected by the, uh, drastic changes in temperature and blasts of wind. So, uh, they even when they're when they're fairly tall but still thin and weak and uh, sensitive and vulnerable, um, they can get stressed. And their trees do have an immune system. Uh, it's not like the human immune system, but all all life can be um, parasitized. Uh, all life can be infected. Uh, even bacteria can get infections. So plants can get infections too. Uh, plants have an immune system. And when they are stressed by extreme temperature changes, their immune system goes down and uh, their natural ability to fight off um, weeds and infections and insects even. Many plants give off chemicals as part of their immune response that make it uh, difficult or, um, or uncomfortable for insects to make their homes inside them to damage them. So... When it's completely open like this, it um, it can be a problem. Now, we can't just come in and snap our fingers and say, add some shrubs. But um, it takes time. It takes time. God has made his creation to be very resilient. So while this is not ideal, it is certainly not going to, obviously it's not going to destroy the forest because the forest is here and has been here for who knows how long. So... Um, there is not a, um, it's not a huge issue, but it is definitely something that we want to um, improve upon. We're taking what we have, and we're improving upon it. Um, oops, that's one thing. Woo, hello. I apologize if you are easily, um, if you get easily seasick. If any of you threw up in your mouth from me uh, dropping the phone and doing that little twirly thing there, uh, that was unintentional, and I apologize. Um, but yeah, so, uh, just, um, this is not to say that humans should never go into the woods, or we should never take anything there, or we should never cut anything down. Things need to cut down. We need to be able to go into the woods. What's the point of having the woods there if we can't go in to take care of it, can't go in to benefit it, can't go in to have it benefit us. Um, it would be like taking a room, going to your bedroom and saying, well, the bedroom needs to stay clean, so I'm going to shut the door and never go into the bedroom. Well, no, that's kind of dumb. That's what the bedroom is there for. So I believe, as a Christian, as uh, uh, the Bible says that Yahweh made man uh, to care for his creation, and to benefit from it for him, we need to be able to go into the woods. So there, logically speaking, if it is true that we have to be able to go into the woods to take care of it, and this edge needs to be improved, then there must be a way to do both. If both things have to happen, then there must be a way to do both. And I believe there is. Um, probably selecting a few... I mean, we have, we have to talk about it. There are several... The majority of the people on, uh, on this property are legal adults and uh, have 
some level, uh, varying levels of decision making on this. Everyone has their own part to fill and their own ideas and experience to lend. So it will not be one person, again, snapping their fingers and saying, this is how it's going to be. Uh, none of us is going to do that because that's not the way a community can function that is prideful and selfish. And uh, many people and communities have tried to do that and failed and fallen apart. We don't plan on doing that. But I would imagine that probably what would happen would be selecting several areas that are naturally kind of cleared out. For example, this spot. It was a natural place to enter because the vines were kind of lower and um, we also had to get in there to cut down a couple trees. So there's, there's a natural path. It also connects to a couple of deer trails. Um, so it is a natural, intuitive place to enter the woods. You can get pretty much anywhere in the woods from here. So there are several places along this area that could be kept open. But then what you do is you plant, uh, you smother the, the vines, especially the vines that are uh, dangerous to people and to animals and to, well, not mainly to animals, people and plants like poison ivy. Um, we're not sure how allergic most of us are to poison ivy, but some of us, uh, some of us, it's, it would not be good. Um, pretty well, I know that I'm allergic a little bit because I have several poison ivy blisters on my feet right now from um, just normal exposure. But yeah, so it would be um, choke out the vines that are there. Um, now they are doing their job. They're covering damaged, unprotected soil. But now that we are here and we have a better way of doing this, their time is over. So what we can do is we can choke those out and plant shrubs and bushes that come a little further out. Um, now I don't know how far that would be. And then there would naturally be other vines. Um, but there would be fewer vines because most vines, the reason that they run up trees and end up choking them out is because the vines rely on a lot of sun. Well, when you have shrubs, you have trees and then shrubs and then bushes, the vines won't grow up the tree because there's no light. They have to get all the way up before they get light. So the vines would be naturally um, very limited. And then constant foot traffic across a path uh, and just regular maintenance, just, oh, look, there's a bit of poison ivy that got snippet done. Um, but that will definitely be a longer process. We have a lot of conversations to have first. Um, and that's just my idea based on the little bit that I know. And um, we will see what happens when, uh, the, when the rest of the family is able to talk about it and figure this out. Saturday, several developments. One of them, we got Keats. We got the replacements. They're all doing well. This guy's not feeling too good right now. He, yeah, you can hear him cheeping because he's lonely. Uh, so I'll put him back, but I wanted to show him to you. Uh, guineas are very social birds. Um, they do not like being separated from each other, especially ones that uh, that are approximately the, the same age of, and have been raised together like these are. They are also extremely skittish. Uh, so they do not like being touched uh, and they will run away from you. So I had to kind of track that one down and grab him. Um, very gently, because as you saw, he's very small. Um, but these are a bit older than the ones we had gotten the last time. So they, uh, they are, um, they're not as fragile as the previous ones. Um, so yeah, these were the replacements for the eight that, uh, that died within the first few days. Um, so we now have 10. They actually sent us two extras. Fantastic company to work with. Um, uh, we are really impressed with their customer service. So yeah, we now have 12 guineas. Um, besides the one that we had to kill uh, yesterday as earlier in the video because it had all sorts of problems with its legs and we tried to fix it, but it, it it was beyond hope. So we dispatched it quick quick and uh, as painless as possible. Uh, we also got chicks. We got them a while ago. 
um, but I haven't been able to get a video of them because they've been so small, but they're, they're a little older now. So here's this guy. We have three types. I finally figured out what uh, types they are. It's the Australorp, the Dominique, and the... Um, suddenly I forgot the third one. I will tell you eventually. Um, but yeah, so we've got three types. Uh, one of them is uh, just straight up yellow, kind of like people are accustomed to chicks being. Uh, this is gonna, their color, the adult coloring is about like this, um, kind of black and a little bit of yellow. Um, he's not nearly as skittish as the Keats, but he is ready to go back in, so I'll put him back in. We did have to, uh, move them to a larger enclosure, because we had, we had four brooder boxes set up, um, three for the chicks and one for the Keats. Um, but all of them were getting far too big. Uh, they needed room to move. They were testing out their wings. They were trying to jump out. Um, and they weren't moving around very much because they didn't have a whole lot of room. So we cobbled together some cardboard boxes and taped them together using duct tape. So the Keats have a box and all 30 of the chicks also have a box. And they've loved that. It's so much fun to see the, uh, both of them, but especially the chicks. The chicks seem to be more, um, more confident, I guess. Uh, they'll, of course they're only about this big, but they will take off running across the cardboard box, flapping their wings as fast as they can. And sometimes they'll just run it straight into the side of the cardboard box, which is, you know, it's kind of like, oh, you watch, watch a baby run and fall down and bop its nose and cry. And it's, it's cute, but it's also kind of sad, but it's, it's like, that's part of growing up. There is not a single baby in the world who has not run, fallen down, and bumped its uh, nose. And I'm sure that there's not a, a single baby chicken in the world that uh, has not, when it has a chance, run and fall down. So we're watching them do that. So that's interesting to see the uh, similarities between uh, the behavior of young beings, both human and animal. Um, but yeah, so giving them a bigger enclosure, as is to be expected, they're eating a ridiculous amount and um, defecating all over the place. So uh, I think we have to change their bedding about three times a day, um, basically every time that we replace their food and water. So that's, you know, it's part of taking care of life. Life has input and output and you gotta take care of the output. But uh, it works for us because we have a compost pile and that stuff is organic material, so it composts well. Um, one thing that we are having to keep an eye out for with um, raising these little birds, since they do not have their mothers to care for them, and they have to be, well, because they don't have their mothers to constantly guide them they need to be kept in a box um, that's not a natural habitat but that's the only way that we can do it since they do not have their mothers um, so with that comes a slightly extra amount of stress for the birds which affects their digestion so it becomes what is commonly known in the industry as pasty butt which is their behind um, picks up and hangs on their their um, their feces get stuck in some of their feathers. So that needs to be cleaned um, regularly. Um, the result of not doing so being that it plugs the hole and they get backed up and die. So while that is not the most pleasant part of taking care of these things, um, you check on it once or twice a day. If you see anything, Take a, a rag, um, get it wet, wring it out so it's damp, wipe it off, let them air dry. It's fine. It's maybe, you know, total, probably a half hour a day of total upkeep. That includes cleaning them, cleaning them up, cleaning up after them, feeding them, changing their water, changing their bedding, watching them, um, we found that they uh, they enjoy, of course, 
they enjoy a bit of greens in their diet so they are really excited when we uh, pick a dandelion or a head of clover and hang it down over the edge of the enclosure and uh, they all come running and jump up and, and peck at it until uh, they pull the thing apart and then one of them will grab the head, the little green part attached to the stem uh, and run off with it and they all chase it around trying to get it. We saw that with our, uh, when we had full grown chickens up um, at the, uh, the old house up in the city and let's see if I can change that. There we go. There we go. So, yeah, just uh, life with animals. And we keep finding more and more and more cedar trees, eastern red cedars. There is one that I transplanted. This guy, let me see if I can get down here. Get down, here we go. There he is. He's about yay tall, three, four inches tall. Um, I think he got mowed over a bit because his he's kind of flat and spread out like a bonsai tree. So, I'm glad he survived it. Uh, I think he's cute, but, uh, of course, I found him and transplanted him, so of course I think he's cute. Um, but yeah, so, cedar trees. Apparently they grow like one to two feet a year for the first 30 years, so it'll be great to see, um those grow up not just as growing a tree but it'll also be good for that part of the area because there's nothing really but grass over there it'll be good for the ecology it'll be good for uh, lumber later it'll be good shade um, and some of our favorite birds our family's favorite birds are cedar wax wings we haven't seen too many of them but the reason they have their name is uh, well, the cedar part of their name is because they are quite fond of cedar berries. So, growing a bunch of cedars may be a good way to get um, get those kind of birds. I'm not growing, going to spend 30 years growing trees just so that I can see a particular kind of bird. Um, but it does have that added benefit. So, uh, another thing that happened, uh, we've been exploring the area around us and there is a um, there's an antique mall at least one antique mall in the area um, rather large antique mall and uh, very good staff and owners and a wide variety of, of items I really have never I've been to a couple antique malls but it's been several years um, I was too young to appreciate them then we were just kind of looking around because we had some time and uh, I found something now I'm a camera guy. I love making short films and I like the science of cameras and I found this. This is a Minolta XG9. This is a film camera. Now not like Hollywood film, not like making movies, but this is a, a photography camera that uses film actual film it is not digital it is an slr not a dslr single lens reflex camera um, they started making these in the 70s and they uh, stopped making them years ago i don't remember how long ago but um i um there are some some of the buttons on it are broken but it will still open up it came with a couple of lenses and a flash uh, and I finally got the film cartridge to open, and there is a roll of unused film in it. That's one of my sisters enjoying the, let's see, can we find it? The kite that we got. Um, so, very excited about those as well. But, uh, yeah. Um, I already have a couple cameras. I would not have considered buying another camera except that this one was an amazing price for a decent quality product and it is a film camera. I have seen the quality of some film pictures and it's amazing and I would like to be able to capture the beauty of the landscape and the um, neighboring towns 
on film rather than just on digital pictures. There's a, a color quality and a certain texture that comes from actually using physical film as opposed to just a, a digital copy. Um, I also would not have considered it if uh, a few months ago I had not discovered that uh, there are still people who develop photos, actual film photos, and there are people, um, there's somebody I know that I need to get in touch with who um, uh, knows at least one of those people. So I am excited, I'm really excited for this. Uh, so yeah, that's, uh, it has, doesn't really have anything to do with um, like this project, but well, actually it kind of does. Uh, if you follow our, uh, our Instagram page, which is just the Second Road Project, uh, look that up on Instagram. Um, over the next several months, uh, I may be um, putting some of these on there as well. So that'll be a whole lot of fun.